Hello everyone, today we talk about early medieval Slavs and this is meant to be an introductory video that however I, I think it will be very long, you know it before than me, <laughs> let's say, and now that you're listening uh, and the video is done um, and um, because it's like a, a huge topic, really huge um, and uh, this is really meant nothing more than an introduction uh, also because it talks basically about uh, 500 years of the history and of, uh, of such a large um, portion of Europe, largely basically world central in European history at this time. Um, and uh, as I already said in other videos, um, sometimes I make a kind of western-centered um, type of um, historical discussion, um, the topics I choose are r r r usually related to, to Western Europe. Actually one reason is that what occurred in Western Europe was kind of, m of uh, better documented, sometimes even just more important m just in terms of m think about the population of Western Europe or the uh, per capita wealth compared to the Eastern one. But I definitely sense that uh, in, in historiography in our Western countries uh, we kind of tend to, to forget that there is, um, <coughs> there is else, and there is much else, telling the truth, um, about our same Western uh, identity. I, in, when I use the Western, uh, the Western adjective, um, I I think of it well independently <laughs> from whether the, the way I use it. Um, in, in my mind, when I say Western, uh, it automatically uh, encompasses the whole really Western route, meaning meaning the the especially what was the evolution of the original Indo-European peoples. So it's a very broad concept that doesn't extend on the base of what it's done today on mostly a um, a uh, 20th century um, perspective, especially derived from the um, Western and Eastern blocs, um, for, for which we consider as, um, and, and even in other, <coughs> on the base of, our, of other perceptions, so that we can conceive, I don't know, Japan as a Western country, while Brazil uh, not. Um, which is weird, it's arrived at this point, but uh, since I, I study in the Middle Ages, at least to me it's extremely important to stress the fact that um, Western identity definitely encompasses the Slavs and that Slavic culture and identity are a fundamental core um, of, of, our, uh, of our history as Europeans. Uh, I'm not a Slavic person, but I I definitely think that uh, it's extremely important um, to tell about Eastern European history and the history of the Slavs and of all the other people that uh, entered in contact with them because uh, there weren't just Slavs in Eastern Europe, there were also Turks, um, <coughs> eventually uh, there were also Westerners coming to the East um, and other ethnicities that are, are still part of, uh, of Slavic countries today and that make them so rich in identity and in culture. And today I would like to talk a bit of how it started. I mean, uh, from when we can talk about Slavs, first of all, which is something definitely very complicated, but especially um, from what happened from that time onwards, roughly uh, until the, um, the 11th century, let's say 1080 or arbitrarily. So mm, this is interesting because um, the Slavs are a component of Western uh, identity that appears only in the Middle Ages as such. I mean in, in ancient history we all already had um, the Germans, the Celts, the Italics, uh, the, Hellen the Hellens, the Lusitanians and so on. We don't talk about Slavs. We have from classical sources this Basically, this uh, huge uh, so-called barbaricum that was the, the, these lands of Central and Eastern Europe that extended, um, you know, in in the Roman mind, for instance, that there was no even understanding that existed uh, today's Russia from a geographical point of view, because were, these were lands that were very poor, very primitive. 
uh, with a very little economical <coughs> penetration, although we can't say that west of the Urals, on the contrary, the, the the Mediterranean civilizations like the Romans uh, had definitely an impact on the civilizations of these peoples. Um, and one of the consequences of this is that we don't, we practically have no um, evidence of um, the, uh, the Slavs or the pro Proto-Slavs as such, meaning that we know obviously that there were people living there. And we have even archaeological finds and all, but simply we can't trace. First of all, it's very difficult to date. Uh, <coughs> such things, but uh, uh, even after that, you know, we really don't know who's who. There aren't tags attached, you know, these guys were belonged to this tribe, or the, the material culture was pretty much homogeneous, and, and really the history of those regions before the early Middle Ages is extra it's basically um, impossible to, to, to grasp. And with the early Middle Ages, things do not change radically, because uh, still, the, the, the situation is pretty foggy, but uh, we can at least see that there is a movement that led to basically the Slavization of Slavization, sorry, of of um, <coughs> of most of uh, <coughs> uh, of uh, of Eastern Europe and even parts of of uh, even of, of Central and Southern Europe. Definitely, we will be seeing right now. Uh, that came from this, uh, these peoples um, that um, kind of stand out a little bit um, um, <clears throat> in the fashion they began to expand in their mi migrations simply because differently from other peoples that were kind of um, um, that had a certain degree of cohesion, of stratification, of verticalization of society and therefore could for the, first of all, identify themselves as different peoples, mostly a, a, on a confer, uh, confederational level. But um, secondly, um, uh, this would kind of move uh, with modalities of, uh, you know, of military invasions, of armed uh, raids, etc. The Slavs um, <coughs> seemingly um, behaved in a very different way, not because they were better wars than our peoples, but simply because their society was probably um, very different for, for certain reasons that I will try to explain. I'm no expert on, on this part of history, so uh, the more educated of you, just feel free to correct me at any time, but, you know, I just throw what I think it's historically plausible from my perspective, then don't take it as molten gold in any case, uh, whatever I say <laughs> in the first place. Um, basically, there is this wave of guys that uh, begin to move with, um, uh, you know, on the base of very small groups, uh, essentially clans, families. Hmm? Uh, and, and seemingly there was no other greater, um, um, you know, other greater um, um, political body, aside from maybe certain tribes in some fashion, um, and uh, and broader groups of peoples that recognized already themselves maybe as as something apart from the others. But the reasons why this happened and which is controversial is the fact that according to me, um, that I mean, certain people say that these peoples pu were put in motion by the Huns, like other populations of the migration era that dwelled in Eastern and uh, Europe. But uh, to me, things are very different. First of all, it's possible that the Huns and other um, migrating people triggered the Slavic um, migration. But um, as far as I see, you know, the, the Slavs began to um, to to go south and and west uh, in their migration just after the main um, waves of peoples had basically passed, um, and you can see that quite easily as a matter of fact in a timeline. Um, and the reason why I think this happened and, and these peoples were so fragmented and did it and, and seemingly hadn't been part of that melting pot that the migration era had been is that, according to me, they lived in the forests of the north. I mean, the migration era is something that occurred mainly into the steppes um, that stretch from the Hungarian plain to Siberia, essentially. 
um, and um, and there was no involvement on of that other band, um, that other environmental band of the north that was the one of the forests. And since the Slavs, the early Slavs, uh, seem to appear as mm, sedentary populations, in spite of the fact that they were migrating, so they, they were kind of nomadizing themselves in part, and they were mm, they they were uh, agriculturers and um, and uh, or shepherds. I mean, they weren't anything like you know the um, the 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 Sarmatian or Turkish uh, people that um, you could find during the migration era, and they they lived in villages and uh, they had a sort of tribal unit. Um, at this point, they seemed uh, m something that came really after nomadism in those lands. I mean, it's something that basically um, can be explained because these peoples were so primitive and poor that they were in the original state in many ways. They, they were quite similar to the early Germans, you know, tribal societies, very poor, very primitive, not very developed, that could live in communities that, that weren't much greater than the one of, uh, of a village, and that basically um, um, uh, you know, had remained as such uh, in this way because they hadn't um, been thrown into the mess of the migration era, and they, they hadn't had any um, need to to um, to stratify themselves to to to, f to form a, a greater unity, um, a greater verticalization. Um, and, and at this point, uh, in fact, we uh, we see that that's what they did. They moved as a normal population that began to to filter into even um, <coughs> within other peoples that were on the move um, uh, still at that point. They um, they seemingly um, uh, didn't have any um, goal of creating kingdoms or stuff like that. Something that came later. So in certain books, you you say uh, you read things like uh, we know that originally the, Sla the Slavs or Proslavs lived in the plants uh, posed between the Vistula, the Dniester, and the Dnieper rivers. Um, and that they were pushed by uh, you know the migration era to move in my opinion um this this wasn't really the case we don't really know where they came from in the first place it is true that um the the more what um um <coughs> uh, you know what historians today think uh, the original area of, of slavic origin was something at least close to these um uh, to these areas, but it was still a relatively isolated area, in my opinion, compared to the other highways that uh, existed during the migration era. And in fact, of all the peoples that were on the move during migration era, you notice that they weren't part of these area, uh, areas, um, and like because the Germans were too west, the 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 peoples coming from the steppes passed through. Um, passed uh, relatively south, so these guys had remained kind of pure and simple in their their original uh, society, and now they were simply moving in a completely different way than those peoples that had crossed um, Europe for at that point for uh, for over three hundred, four hundred years. Um, <coughs> so. Um, the and and what also um, surprises of the Slavic migrations is how large they actually were. I mean, this was a time in which indeed um, the areas in which they moved were um, quite strongly um, qu uh, depopulated. So it is true that when there is such a condition, it's kind of easier, even with a few people, with a few demic strength, to refill the empty spaces with a single. Um, culture. 
Um, and it's a, it is something you can still find today, and which I find f very fascinating of, of Slavic Europe, that in spite of the difference that and the all the um, kind of um, you know historical resentments that there, there are among the various uh, Slavic nations, um, there is still a general homogeneity of of, of a Slavic uh, identity. I mean, if you think about Western Europe. You rarely say you rarely think of the Germanic countries. Maybe just some kind of you know, some, some kind of uh, um, very um, uh, very um, strong nationalist who wants to stress the the ethnic origins can reason that way. But if you think about the Germans or the Danes or the Danish people, you you just think they are two different things. Um, in, in, in Latin Europe there's never been a pan-Latinism. It seems to me like the French or the Italians or, or, or the Spaniards never needed to conceal themselves as such. The Slavs had a sort of pan-Slavism aside from the um, national differences, but when, when you think about Eastern Europe, it, you, the first thing you think is not the actual the single country, at least in my perspective this is the way, but as as, as a big Slavic area, and this telling the truth can also can be wrong, but um, um, it, it's some still something that um, <coughs> maybe has um, sort of grounding in this sense. There was probably some homogeneity dating back to the, the Slavic migration that really changed the face of of this very big area of Europe. And and that still has this common uh, common identity that is felt more as a Slavic thing than than else. Then obviously I know that the Slavs their listening both strongly disagree, and and I, and I perfectly know why. And I don't want you to and the others to to stress uh, this concept too far as well. But uh, um, just to say that the Slavic component was something that very deeply affected. European identity uh, at that point in the lands where, where it occurred. Um, and um, so they they expanded, um, uh, you know, when um, mostly from, from the 6th century um, and they, they reached Eastern Europe, they uh, reached the Baltic and the Elbe River they began to uh, go also south and east and to blend with those populations that that were there because the migration here uh, had wiped uh, out a lot of peoples then the plague came even there and uh, there were a few people living there but there, there were still certain <coughs> local populations like uh, the the uh, the Jato Dacian mm, populations in uh, today's Romania, partly um, Sarmatians that still existed in some form, um, even the Germans, and uh, seemingly and 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 the Slavs basically assimilated them. If you think, for, for instance, about um, if you think about the Ukraine, uh, seemingly there were. Uh, anthropologists that back especially in the um, in the 19th century went there and they mm, thought that there were certain local communities that definitely had a lot in common with the ancient gods that probably in part had remained there in the Ukraine aside from the guys who <coughs> migrated elsewhere the same in in Dacia um, you know the Visigoths had been there as well so uh, it's still um, it was still a multi-ethnical um, uh, tissue, the one to which the 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 Slavs came to to adhere, and um, and obviously also there is the great push towards the Balkans. This that is something that went really really deep, uh, telling the truth. And at this time, as we were saying, uh, Europe was exhausted. Uh, the Byzantine Empire held. Um, the uh, the territories that were south of the Danube, normally as it had been historically the the Roman border, on the left bank, on the right bank, excuse me, of the Danube, 
Um, and the Slavs simply poured in, and uh, from a Roman perspective, it wasn't neither something so strange nor something so negative, because um, if you need um, demographic strength also to work as a state, to recruit troops, etc., the settlement of these peoples was seen a as a good thing. Uh, first of all, because in any case it couldn't be stopped, because the empire was exhausted at a point. But secondly, because objectively these Slavs, as we were saying, didn't come as conquerors. They simply came to settle, and especially the, uh, the Balkanic and Greek mainland were quite strongly and intensely uh, Slavized. Um, Greece had a very strong impact. The, the, the Slavs arrived even into the Peloponnese. I mean, it was uh, a very deep thing, and uh, the Slavs began to dwell into, into this huge territory and remain there essentially. And uh, and after this um, migration, I mean, the, the Slavic migrations um, terminated um, in. Uh, you can argue that there was a, a, a still a lot of mm, of movement within the same Slavic peoples um, and um, that they weren't completely sedentary at this point. There would be still an idea of that they could change uh, location if the situation was um, fit. And, and this is not surprising because um, those lands uh, in the early Middle Ages weren't that different from the one of the, of, of the ancient world. So those regions had already been inhabited by semi-nomadic populations simply because the local resources weren't enough to, to build strong sanitary society. So, um, so um, uh, they could, the Slavs could be partly sedentary in the way they, they organized their communities but there could be quite easily the Avenians, like there could be in Scandinavia or in other areas of, of, of Europe at that time, that there wouldn't be enough resources for everyone, so that there were even certain big blocks of people that had to to move and to um, to go elsewhere. And, and and we can spot, even if not very clearly, unfortunately, from a historical point of view, of of Slavic populations that migrated, I don't know, from the Elbe to Southern Europe, we will be seeing right now. Um, however, it's important that between the 8th and the 9th century, it was possible to distinguish r very roughly the, um, the, the same um, uh, main uh, repartitions in the Slavic populations that still exist today. So there would be the Eastern Slavs, so the Ukrainians, the Russians, and the uh, White Russians, or Bell Russians, as you want to call them. Then the Westerner, uh, the Western Slavs, um, that included the, the Poles, the Sorbs, the Czechs, and the Slovaks, and the Southern Slavs, the Slovenians, the Croats, the Serbs, and the Macedonians. Um, and it, it's interesting because um, these uh, centuries um, mark, uh, in a certain sense, the, um, the division of the original Slavic, um, we can't say, identity. Not that probably there was a common Sla perception of Slavic identity in a way, in a rational way, but let's say that the differences um, <coughs> between those peoples weren't uh, so sharp uh, up to this point, which in fact they seem to have s uh, definitely sedentarized, and after the ninth century you don't have great movements of of, of Slavic populations across Europe, if not on a, on a small scale like it could happen like you know in the rest of Europe in the more in the already uh, in the in those populations of more ancient uh, ancient sedentarization. So, um, um, the, um, this um, process of differentiation of the, different, uh, of the various um, Slavic nations would correspond also to the construction of, um, <coughs> of more stratified um, societies that in turn corresponded to um, political entities, uh, differentiated political entities. So, um, and there would be also other, uh, other peoples at that point coming to even divide geographically the Slavs. 
for instance, uh, the Magyars, the or Hungers, as you want to call them, and that came to settle. You see here we have a beautiful map in right in the center, dividing essentially the Western Slavs from the southern ones of the Balkans. Um, and um, and um, and 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 it would it would be evident in turn uh, the the progressive differentiation of of the various peoples that had different neighbors, different even different environments in which to develop, etc. Um, however, the two major borders of the Slavic world would would be the Carolingian and the Byzantine one, um, and um, um, and, and at this point, the Slavs, uh, as we said, were more um, uh, cohesive from, from a national point of view. They, they would start to begin, instead to become um, aggressive um, in many ways. And uh, the, the Carolingian border on the Elbe River was a very hot one, and it uh, remained such for, for centuries. Um, the Germans and the Slavs um, already at that time clashing uh, furiously. Um, uh, that that had began even before the Carolingian times, because, for instance, the Saxons, on the, before being conquered by the Carolingians, uh, were regularly uh, at war with the Slavs, and in fact, the same Carolingian conquest of Saxony was achieved through the alliance of the Franks with uh, um, uh, certain Slavic tribes inhabiting the the, El, uh, the the right bank of the Elbe River. And from the Byzantine side, there would be uh, even greater problems. Um, and um, not just because um, of the reasons we explained, but also because the Slavs uh, uh, at this point would become uh, in the Balkans to be um, um, led by the uh, certain newcomers, the Bulgars, that were of tar uh, Turkic um, or Turkic, I don't know how you say that in English. Uh, origin, and that created a huge empire that we will be seeing it in, in a short while. Uh, created lots of problems to the Byzantines for for centuries. Um, but uh, for now, I, I would like to stress instead another element that I b believe is very important because, obviously, uh, at this point we we start having a, a, histo a good historical documentation of the Slavs, not much by uh, the Slavic sources that were quite practically non-existent in documentary terms, but from the uh, the other peoples that met them. At this point, we named the Carolingians. We named the fact that Carolingians were uh, the Byzantines, um, and and we have to think that all these populations uh, were basically empires, and they were Christian empires, uh, more importantly, and and therefore, um, uh, um, uh, besides just obviously observing the, these newcomers. Um, with the arrival of the Slavs and during the second invasions, there was a generally re, um, renewed interest in um, in the old uh, ethnographical traditions. This happened every time you know there, there are new peoples that you 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 meet. Um, but there would be also great interest to uh, absorb um, these uh, peoples into your uh, political sphere of influence. And a very good way to do that was wasn't just with arms and uh, and diplomatic relations, but also to uh, through um, a cultural um, approach, and that was prevalently um, entrusted to the avant uh, to the uh, to the church uh, that tried to to Christianize these people. So there would be new missions sent. Um, uh, towards uh, Central and Eastern Europe at this time, um, and uh, the the greater um, results were the the ones uh, at least initially the ones of the Byzantines, who um, through the monks uh, Cyrillus and Methodius um, um, managed to do a great work of of cultural mediation and of conversion. Um, they went um, first of all um, uh, among the um, the southern Slavs in 863, 
because they were the closest ones to, to the Byzantine Empire, they translated the Bible in Paleo-Slavic language, very important. Um, just think about what had happened with, with the Germanic language of the Goths with, uh, back in the day, always uh, through the, uh, by the hands of the Byzantines, or at least um, Romanized, uh, a Romanized Goth like Ulfila. And it was created also in that um, occasion, um, well, not really uh, like in that other occasion, but here it was created a new alphabet, that is the Glagolitic, then um, Cyrillic. Uh, that was derived from the Greek one, um, which is pretty evident if you read Cyrillic, there are many letters that are extremely close to, to, to the Greek ones. Um, and they... Um, uh, and, and which were some, which was something extremely new within the Slavs, because they, um, uh, they, they, uh, they didn't write, you know, like the the uh, originally it, it had been the case for the Germans, etc. Um, and and the Glagolitic uh, uh, was able to reproduce the um, uh, the um, phonemes of the uh, Slavic language, and it is uh, used still today as such, um, uh, as an alphabet. And 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 it, it's in this moment that also the Eastern Slavs begin to enter into the um, to the orbit of uh, the uh, the Byzantine Empire, while the Western Slavs were won instead by the um, the Western Church uh, and therefore by the Germanic uh, emperors and the Church of Rome, um, there was a lot of clash between <laughs> um, uh, East and West for this reason. Um, at this point, eventually, um, the greater success was won by the West because they managed to win eventually even the Magyars. And, and generally speaking, um, I think even about the Poles that uh, were f at a point fully Catholic by at least the twelve uh, at latest for, um, by the twelfth century. You know, um, uh, there would be historically uh, a greater success um, uh, uh, during the Middle Ages of the Western Church, even though a, a huge part of Slavs uh, remained. Um, uh, instead on the uh, on the orthodox side and um, uh, the and, and still today um, uh, most of the Slavs are orthodox but thanks mostly to the fact that uh, today uh, demographics is a bit different think about Russia uh, Russia in those days wasn't so large demographically so uh, in those times in perspective uh, it was uh, kind of um, a victory of, of the Catholics um, that, by the way, at this point weren't really conceiving themselves as such or better. They defined... Uh, the, the, the Christian Church was defined Catholic in absolute terms, then the uh, schism would happen uh, later um, between East and West. But the most important thing at this point, at least from a Slavic point of view, uh, not to say that the Christianization wasn't an important factor, on the contrary, was the formation of the mm, Slavic states, we can say, which happened, by the way, through the Christianization, largely, if anything, because, you know, if you want to, um, <coughs> for many reasons, um, first of all, getting Christianized, like it had happened for the Germans during the migration era, had been um, a very um, useful political tool because you could enter into a privileged relation with um, with the um, either the, the the Western or Eastern uh, Roman Empire. Um, um, uh, at this point, it would be the, the, the Carolingian and the Byzantine Empire, um, even though <laughs> the real Roman one was actually the, the latter. Um, but, you know, in practice, there were two empires at that time, East and West. Um, and, um, and secondly, uh, Christianization implied the ability of the Slavic peoples at this point of creating 
um, written documents um, that could be used in an archive, in a court, in an administration, and those are all very um, vital tools in order to build um, a strong political power. So. Um, the, um, the the first attempts to create um, 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 a, a, a territorial, um, a political and territorial organism uh, happened in the um, in the Balkans and and firstly probably um, among the Serbs that um, by the ninth century began to um, to gain independence from the uh, the Byzantine Empire into which they they had dwelled formally at that point, um, because they the Serbs had settled there and they um, they had stayed there simply you know with the uh, with the okay of the imperial authorities and uh, they uh, on, for, for the Byzantines the Slavs at at a point were quite useful because they could basically work as a sort of shield f uh, for the empire towards uh, our population existing from the other side. So uh, the Serbs uh, um, had settled in the right bank of the Danube um, and um, un until they, they didn't have a, a, politi a, a strong national political cohesion they could be easily controlled, even though they already uh, le and and there would be a quite permeable uh, situation here because there there would be Byzantine strongholds um, among um, even uh, among certain areas of, of of these Slavic populations that were just aimed at keeping a general order, but there was no practical direct. Um, um, subjugation of these peoples. It wasn't needed. The important thing is that they would remain calm. Then the empire was, uh, you know, had uh, at the moment uh, other interests in other strategical theaters. Well, the Serbs at a certain point start instead to, you know, to, to decide uh, that uh, they could uh, achieve something greater. And and by the ninth century, they they kind of gained. Um, uh, uh, a practical independence uh, from the autonomy that that they had, um, and the um, um, and this would happen at the same time with uh, their uh, rivals and um, bordering uh, Croats that um, instead were um, tied um, um, to the um, um uh, to to a more western uh, direction in, in in many ways um and and they would even become um you know christianized uh, eventually um um also thanks to the roman church that they saw as a greater partner than the um the 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 Orthodox Church, uh, if anything, because they um, um, they were also mm, you know feeling um, threatened by their Eastern Slavic neighbors who were uh, under uh, uh, the, the Byzantines from a religious point of view. So there would also this would also be a, a political marker to say you know we are. Um, a different thing, and we want to remain uh, as such. And the Serbs were, the Serbs, Serbs, better say, yeah, the Serbs were um, decisive in containing also the Bul Bulgar and later Bulgarian power. Um, and uh, by the mid of the ninth century, there would be another um, power that we find here in the map, which is uh, the Great Moravia. And then instead revolved uh, around this area that encompasses today's uh, roughly today's Slovakia and um, at a point even most of um, of uh, Czech Republic um, and um, and and this had been the lands uh, the land from which by the way um, the um, um the the the, ac the mission of Cyrillus and Metodius had taken place 
and that, uh, however, uh, would have been uh, would have disappeared as a political entity in uh, 906 um, by the hands of the Majors that um, uh, basically destroyed it. And as we've seen, um, as we can't see from the map at least here, uh, the Great Moravia was a was a quite large um, um, dominion. Uh, uh, it rose um, also over um, over other peoples, uh, not just uh, uh, you know it wasn't just a single. Um, uh, ethnical bloc, and however, one of the characteristics of the Slavic states at this point, especially in the, the in the Western area, was kind of the uh, the um, you know the instability of them. I mean, we we called them states, but there weren't anything like real states at this point. It would be uh, dominations of certain aristocracies over over others um, because of certain favorable, favorable conditions but there wasn't really anything permanent or stable or structural in them so they could such very large dominions could rise and fall uh, in a very short time and this is typical of, um, of situations in to which you don't have a, a real in concrete um, unity or centralized uh, organization um, and um the um the the, the another, another experiment however that uh would be more successful historically speaking but also here took more time to um uh, 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 a greater time to 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 fully develop was in the north um in in poland um and it basically started into the 10th century. Uh, it was the foundation of the Kingdom of Poland pr uh, proper uh, uh, by the hands of, of uh, the first king, Mieszko uh, I, um, that ruled from uh, 960 to 992. Um, you have to think that um, even when we say dates here, it's all pretty vague, historically speaking. I mean, in the case of Mieszko, uh, we have pretty good documentation, generally speaking, but for previous um, political entities, uh, the, so the sources are quite often just, at that point, exiting from a sort of mythical past and, uh, and acquire more uh, historical consistency. So we're still in a very, still very primitive world that was being uh, developed and and modernized, we can say, um, also thanks to the um, the uh, relations with the uh, the Western powers, like in, in the case of Poland uh, or Bohemia. Uh, indeed, uh, the, um, the the German influence was was crucial, especially in the Western areas of these kingdoms, to adopt, um, for instance, forms of feudalism. Um, certain models was a, a kind of uh, frankiz frankization of, of these peoples, like it was happening for the Scandinavians, um, uh, etc. Um, and the Kingdom of Poland at this point stretched um, mm, to the from the Baltic to the Oder River and to the Carpathians, uh, being a quite big thing. Here we see it um, in a small fashion because this map is uh, from uh, from the year 900 so you see that there is this red um, core of poles that eventually enlarged itself considerably um, and, and arriving to encompass especially from from east to west a very large amount of of populations um and um and and um the and and the very meaningful um aspect of this uh the foundation of this kingdom is that um it was put by uh, the the king by the um uh the protection of uh the pope of rome um so uh, the Mietzko, uh Mietzko, uh son uh, Boleslav the, the the bold that ruled instead from 992 to 1025 
managed, uh, even if uh, for a mm, short time, for a to uh, extend uh, the Polish sovereignty even over Bohemia. Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it was a really brief uh, episode. Um, the, um, the Bohemians uh, would be at that point developing in turn their own, uh, their own um, um, state uh, in many ways under the the Permislids, um, the Permislid dynasty that finished only, uh, it was very ancient and, um, and would be extinguished only uh, in the 14th century, uh, constantly ruling uh, Bohemia. Um, and by this time, Bohemia was um, similarly organized as a sort of uh, mm, um, domain uh, with the Premislids are as the leading um, aristocratic uh, family and our clients um, uh, operating under their uh, in, in alliance with them and since the uh, mid of the 10th century Bohemia was organized as a duchy mm -hmm. um, and subjected to the German Emperor. Basically the Bohemians entered to be part of the Holy Roman Empire and were practically uh, the only, um, they would become uh, later um, even a kingdom on their own just like the one of Germany and of Italy and of Bourgogne. And it would be quite important because at this point you understand that they intervened into the German matters not just in the Eastern ones and they kind of played uh, between East and West, like uh, here we saw that initially the, the Poles tried to impose their authority on Bohemia, but uh, in later history it would be really the other way around, like the Bohemian king being very powerful and capable of expanding his power over uh, very large parts of Poland. Um, and we're talking about a f forms of power, and this is important to stress, that were really nominal most in most of the cases but still reflected the you know the, the, the kind of of gravity that uh, of this gravitational mass that uh, the singular uh, political entities had so that even if you didn't f directly control one population why one political entity you, s you could still influence it at the point of making it going in your direction and this was being tried when we talk about the creation of a state here this is in practice instead what, what was uh, happening um, even though Bohemia uh, was also the uh, the most highly Germanized um, uh, Slavic uh, state and it, in this sense it inherited also mm, mm, feudalism uh, part of uh, the Western um, administrative models and it would be it would it was destined to grow as uh, as a very powerful state even during low middle ages um, thanks to this in spite of its relatively um, small size compared to Poland for instance that eventually made it to become a very powerful but uh, later and with with a greater uh, you know with a longer development as we were saying now, um, coming back uh, in the south, uh, we have to talk about the Bulgars that weren't um, Slavs. Uh, the Bulgarians today are Slavs, the Bulgars weren't. The Bulgars were um, this, um, um, this um, reign that had been created into the lower Danube um, by, uh, by this Turchic uh, uh, population that uh, came from the uh, the steppes, uh, seemingly of the uh, middle and low uh, Volga river, originally speaking. Um, those were regions from which our mm, Turkic people that eventually settled in um, into Europe would come from, seemingly, like the Avars, that by the way had brought a lot of Slavs during the path under them and made them uh, partly their slaves. Uh, it's interesting that the, word, the same word Slav actually derives from, from this. I mean, it, it, it's, it's like uh, because they were named as slaves because they usually came, um, they had come in part in the very early stage of their migration under other peoples that basically mm, um, 
uh, had subjugated them, uh, um, some of their communities, and brought uh, them alongside with them. Um, and uh, the Bulgars uh, were um, were uh, a minority. I mean, when we think about these peoples on the move, um, we we don't we can count them at maximum something like tens of in the tens of thousands, like. And the Slavs that lived in uh, in the lands that would eventually be called as Bulgaria were instead more, and uh, and therefore the Bulgars um, were progressively assimilated by the same subjects and become Slavs, in fact. Um, and uh, this is something that happened also into Hungary, even if in a different way, because today's Bulgaria speaks uh, a Slavic language, while today's um, Hungary speaks uh, uh, an Agro-Finnic language, like in Turkey and in Finland. Uh, so that mm, Hungary is partly a Slavic country, but not completely <laughs> in some way. While uh, Bulgaria uh, saw this change from the Bulgars to the Bulgarians proper, um, and characterizing itself as a as a Slavic uh, empire in many ways, although the leading uh, culture would always maintain uh, the myth, the cult in many ways of the ancient um, uh, people mm, of the steppes that had come and brought certain mm, political and military models that uh, in spite diluted over time in the land would still be a point of reference this this happened in in the very same way in the into into those uh, romano germanic kingdoms where the majority of the population was latin or latinized and uh, germans were a few but they managed somehow to to um to germanize culturally the latin populations um so this is how it happened during the migrations, usually at that time. And uh, the Bulgars, uh, the Bulgarians better at this point, managed uh, to, um, um, to, um, to, to take, to, to annex to their domains a certain Slavic lands of Serbia and to remain independent, independent from Constantinople. Uh, at least until the beginning of the 11th century, in which instead they were uh, annihilated uh, militarily, and uh, and although the Slavic um, identity of the Bulgarians uh, remained as such, you know, uh, uh, over time, and Bulgaria would come as uh, to be as a, a political entity into to the late um, Middle Ages, even still causing problems to Constantinople, the old. Um, Bulgar Empire, Bulgarian Empire, um, had been uh, would be destroyed by the Byzantines um, in 1018, by uh, the famously by the the, the Roman Emperor uh, Basil II called Bulgaroktonos because he was, m which mean, means the the slaughterer of Bulgars. Um, and um, and however, the Bulgarian Empire for the Bulgar Empire for the, the time it, it you know it especially across the um, between the um, the the ninth and tenth century was a very big power here in fact you can't see uh, basically uh, the the empire uh, at the peak of its uh, extension it's freaking huge right um, it was definitely uh, uh, quite of a power also military terms uh, the Bulgars being, you know, quite um, quite skilled in warfare and causing a lot of problems to the Byzantines. So the Byzantines, at a point, um, um, were obliged to to kind of make the same um, Bulgars um, participate to the empire in some fashion, so that the the Tsar Simeon, in uh, ruled from 893. Um, uh, to nine, uh, 827, uh, even though he managed to bring the uh, his people to the apex of uh, of his power, um, he also was um, uh, guided in many ways in the strengthening of uh, of his state by the Byzantine um, missionaries. 
um, uh, he had been raised and educated in uh, in, um, in in Constantinople, uh, and he was promised a sort of um, Slavic Byzantine Empire in many ways. Uh, he he considered himself uh, Tsar, in fact, which means uh, Caesar. So it was a title that he chose for himself to. Um, to to feel at the same level of the uh, of the uh, Roman emperors uh, of Constantinople, um, and this um, uh, relation was obviously very double-edged because both Constantinople and uh, the Bulgarians um, achieved their own um, you know uh, their own gains through this collaboration, but at the same time through this partnership. But they at the same time they um, uh, they they were quite distrustful to one of the other, and um, they would still you know tell each own th uh, each one in their own um, story about how it was. Like uh, the, the Byzantines were saying that this mm, you know into the far of the ancient um, uh, Roman traditions that they had managed to Romanize these barbaric people of the Bulgars and to even. Uh, made them their adoptive sons and all like that. The Bulgars, um, about whom we know much le uh, about whose perspective we know much less, because they they didn't write as much as the Byzantines. Instead, would would think it the other way around. Like uh, the Tsar Simeon surely thought he was um, basically superior. He surely felt him himself to be superior to the Romans, and that he he had. Uh, basically uh, obliged them to to accept him as a co-ruler that uh, basically was the the highest um, 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 political title on heart uh, and therefore in turn marrying uh, the um, the Byzantine conception and the, the centrality of Byzantium etc wh which was very important and it was all played on on this fashion um, to conclude, even if it's uh, a very big chapter on, on its own, um, I would like to talk about Eastern Slavs and the what was happening in the uh, Eastern Plains of uh, Russia and the Ukraine. Um, these areas, um, differently from uh, the other Slavic lands, would uh, undergo to uh, the um, to the Viking invasions, uh, uh, the the Varangians or uh, that were um, merchants and warriors coming from Scandinavia, mostly from Sweden, um, were making uh, were making um, in to the Russian lands between uh, um, Novgorod and Kiev, um, Kiev a, a lot of um, um, a lot of money, <laughs> telling the truth. And also politics, in the sense that in the same um, greater centers, uh, they were developing as cities, essentially, li like in Novgorod and, and Kiev, they were, in fact, the most developed economic centers. They they began to to rule and to have at least a sh or, or or at least to have a share uh, of their power, and becoming essentially uh, lords. But also in here, and probably much less than it's been thought before, and even less than much less than what happened for the Bulgars in uh, in Trace, the um, the Varangians, uh, were quite a few numerically, and they were assimilated by the um, Slavic uh, Eastern populations and. Uh, there is, I think, uh, a study by Abulafia that, uh, uh, by Todorov, sorry, by Todorov, who, uh, simi uh, who demonstrates this uh, convincingly that essentially what was created uh, in 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 this um, phase of history as the principality of Rus um, or or Rus of Kiev uh, would be a mostly Slavic uh, achievement. Um, and and it 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 was created essentially through uh, through Slavic aristocracies and, and only with a very superficial degree of um, of uh, Scandinavian uh, Scandinavian influences. Not that these were had not been important also to put in motion the same 
um, the same trade across the uh, across Russia and the great rivers of Russia, so between the Baltic Sea, Scandinavia, and the Black Sea and Constantinople. But um, the um, the uh, the name uh, of of the Rus uh, actually uh, recalls, uh, in fact, the. Uh, the denomination that the, the Slavs had towards the, bar, uh, the Varangians. Um, and um, and, and the, s the main center um, um, was, was Kiev, so also here um, that's where basically the, 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 the principality took in na its name from. Uh, as you can see from the map, it was a pretty extended um, domain. Also in here, we don't have to think about the Principality of Kiev as something, you know, that, that really controlled everything in here. It was a kind of broad um, domination that nominally stretched um, uh, very, very long, especially towards the north in here, and that would um, quite soon open its way uh, to the south and uh, to be in contact also with Constantinople and creating a lot of problems with the same um, to the same empire up to a certain point and and, and Kiev would be this um, extremely important city um, placed on the river um, so um, an area that so uh, a great uh, economical development for thanks to trade but also through cultural exchanges um, between various uh, peoples that um, communicated through through those um, through those uh, um, roads let's say um, and um, and and it was under uh, S uh, Sviatoslav uh, that ruled from 945 to 973 that it that to open um, its way uh, towards the uh, the southern uh, um, lands um, to um, to pursue the control of the uh, commercial. Um, a route that, uh, as we said, uh, connected the Baltic uh, Sea with the Black Sea. Um, and um, to make it very simple, you know, at this point, um, the the opening towards the Black Sea would immediately mean to enter in contact with Constantinople, that had uh, historically had always a great uh, influence on Crimea and the Black Sea coasts. Um, as a wall, um, and the son of of, of Sviatoslav, uh, that was Vladimir the Great, who ruled from na 980 to 1012, would even man manage to um, to mm, to marry the um, the sister of the Emperor Basil the Second, the one who had wiped out the Bulgarians, uh, the Princess Anna, mm, and. Impo quite importantly, through this marriage, to accept Christian religion also in here. Um, and um, uh, basically, Vladimir um, made a, a great baptism um, uh, ceremony that uh, had to represent the conversion of the wall of his world people um, and took place in the, in the Dnieper River, in fact. Um, in the 989, so it was like um, he baptized in that occasion all the population of Kiev. Um, it was obviously a quite strong biblical um, propaganda uh, picture, uh, like in the, <laughs> the Dnieper becoming uh, the Jordan River essentially. Um, and more importantly, what he g what um, uh, what Vladimir got. Uh, thanks to this action, that it was that Kiev became a metropolitic seat. This was extremely important because um, this could be decided only by Constantinople, theoretically, at least in the East at that point, uh, Constantinople um, authority in religious mat matter was un undisputed. Uh, these were the same years uh, rightly uh, before the, the schism with the West that, however, was already very far and didn't and was Rome w being very powerful um, in the west but not having much of a say at this point in the east 
Um, and um, and through the um, the, uh, the appointment of Kiev as a metropolitic seat, uh, the uh, Constantinople um, Patriarch could basically control uh, the um, uh, the his um, Russian counterpart and to interfere into the religious authority, uh, in, in, into the religious matters of, 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 of uh, the Principality of Kiev. Um, and, and these ties with, uh, with Constantinople had, would have had a, a huge impact in the history of Russia and in, in its uh, relation with the, with the Western world. Um, and, uh, and in fact, um, you know, um, Kiev was conceived as the third Rome after uh, Rome and Constantinople, and eventually, even when the uh, the, cons um, the the Roman Empire fell in the 15th century, um, the um, the Principality of Kiev didn't exist anymore. It was the Principality of the Moscova uh, that would try to to gain uh, uh, in many ways this um, the the legacy of of Constantinople in religious matters as the center of um, the Orthodox world um, and that would be quite important at that point in a Russia that was was almost completely Christianized and and therefore and and, and Christianized according to the Eastern uh, uh, Eastern tradition, so responding to the, at least ideally, to the um, the, the main um, political uh, authority um, that had been, but originally it had been Kiev, really, uh, that uh, had had this uh, prerogative uh, from the same empire, um, and um, uh, what else do I wanted to say? Well. I think it's enough <laughs> for today. Um, I, um, I it was a bit messy. I should have told lots of other things, like the the Russians, for, for instance, just about the relation between the Principality of Kiev and and Constantinople. Those were amazing. I mean, at a point, the Russians even invaded, uh, put Constantinople under siege, being defeated. But I mean, they were a huge power and a hell of a power and. And what I think is important, historically speaking, is that um, uh, there is um, an absence um, of, of Eastern European history that we can't just explain, um, unfortunately, through you know a Western-centric mind. But the problem is that the Eastern that Eastern Europeans uh, in, in these centuries that we have seen. Um, wrote much less than in the West. So even a pr the Principality of Kiev was a huge thing, really, had a lot of power, it was an extremely developed um, uh, political uh, entity um, uh, at the uh, uh, height of its power. Um, you know, uh, w is a system that we don't really know pretty well and and this is really a pity because we know as a matter of fact it was extremely powerful and this is a problem that, that we get largely with with most of non-western um, uh, political entities uh, at this point because um, you know uh, the, there are there are differences indeed also in the forms of documentary production in uh, simply also in the mentality um, and, so, and sometimes we miss, uh, or we kind of down, downsized uh, um, subjectively the, the importance of, of, these, um, uh, of these stories because simply we know less in, in, in terms of sources uh, about them. But this didn't mean at all that these um, political entities weren't important or that they're not worth to be studied or that they didn't affect our um uh our story uh, there was also a lot of contact at this point between um between uh, east and west the principality of russia had um uh, relation diplomatic relations with france for instance uh, there would be cultural exchanges between the two um the two kingdoms uh, so it, it was something that um that really 
mm, catalyzed the process of development of our Western uh, civilization. Um, and Slavic history, in, in this sense, really deserves much more uh, attention than the, the way we, we normally um, have for it, at least in the West. And we should make an effort and pick, read, uh, you know, pick a book and read about it, and to really uh, understand why <laughs> um, uh, n their history is so important. By the way, uh, especially about the Middle Ages, I'm terribly fascinated with countries like Bulgaria or Poland or the Ukraine uh, because those are um, places where um, into which um, um, a really amazing thing ha things happened and we we lost the, the the perception of bad thing for the principality of Kiev being dis uh, destroyed by the Mon <laughs> by the Mongols in in the 13th century and that brought telling the truth um, uh, the principality was already in decline at that point but uh, yeah the Mongols surely didn't help and they they had especially at that time a quite pre standard uh, attitude towards those who existed them to, which was raising them to the ground so uh, even it's even fascinating to to think that the, the actual Russian uh, civilization started into the Ukraine uh, and not in Russia I mean when Kiev was a huge capital that really uh, decided what was happening uh, uh, all around and interfering with Constantinople and a waging war in, in very big numbers. Moscow was something um, that that is not even named in two historical sources. So, and ironically speaking, uh, that even came. And Novgorod came. Uh, Novgorod, uh, Novgorod survived. They also feared the Mongolian invasion, but they kind of entered into another circuit. That is the one of the Baltic Sea. Although Novgorod is not in the Baltic, but um, it be began to interact mostly with uh, the powers that uh, that appeared into the Baltic, uh, uh, the Lithuanians, but also the the, the Germans, the, the Danes, uh, etc. And eventually, Novgorod would be conquered, however, by um, by Moscow in later times. Um, uh, but yeah, there are many things that could be really said about this, and I will come back on Slavic history. I don't know whether soon or not, but I hope that I will um, explain more in detail all these things. Um, if you are interested, let me know. I hope um, I was I had a, you know I, I was able to to tell in general the whole thing. As I said at the beginning, this was an introductory video, so. I didn't have a greater aim to go more in depth uh, to the topic, but I hope that this helped at least if you I don't know if you never heard about the Great Moravia or you had never wondered about the Bulgarian Empire. Um, I mean, this could be helpful a little bit, and um, I'm sorry for all the things I missed or I said wrong. <laughs> If there are, please let me know, and we can even adjust, and maybe I can make a dedicated video, a more pertinent and detailed one about a certain, uh, a certain power or another. But I will surely cover this in uh, in the future. So I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please share it. Otherwise, leave a like or subscribe to my channel to receive further news about my contents. For now, I wish you a nice time and see you. Uh, next time. Bye.